Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Lauren Barrett. I'm the Global Beverage Innovation Manager here at BevZero. And today we're going to be focusing on microbial stabilization of non-alcoholic beverages, and I'll be sharing an international discussion with the BevZero team. Before we get started with the webinar, I just wanted to go over a few formalities. This webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on our website. Please refrain from using the chat box during the presentation. There will be a designated Q&A session at the end of the discussion, and there is a designated Q&A chat box where you will be inputting those questions. Um, if the chat box is distracting, you can toggle it closed. And if anyone's having any technical difficulties, we do have a team member who will try to assist you, but definitely Chrome web browser is recommended for the Click Meeting platform. In today's presentation, I'll be giving a background touching on fermented beverage microbial ecology and various microbial stabilization techniques. And then we'll be getting into market demand and trends, which consist of recorded discussions that I've had with the international BevZero team. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started with fermented beverages and microbial ecology. Here at BevZero, we specialize in the removal of alcohol from wine, beer, and cider. Now, the benefit of using a fermented beverage base over a purely formulated product, which just might have water and flavors or sugars added to it, is that a fermentation alone acts as a microbial stabilization step. So what we can see on the right hand side is a graph which is showing the microbial evolution during vinification. And here we have the harvest phase, which is full of nutrients, sugars. What we can see here is there's a very high level of non-saccharomyces yeast and spoilage yeast and bacteria. Saccharomyces is so well adapted to fermentation that it's actually able to outcompete these community members and be the dominant competitive organism in fermentation. This has a huge benefit because it's actually inhibiting many types of pathogenic microorganisms, which are much more of a risk with juices and formulated beverages. In this fermentation process, there's also different types of secondary metabolites, which can help with this microbial inhibition, as well as enhancement of flavor and sensory. They can also act as various types of prebiotics. So there's a lot of benefits to using a fermented beverage base over just purely formulation. I also wanted to touch on log reduction before we go into some of the other technologies for microbial stabilization. Log reduction is the idea of reducing a microbial population and it's a metric to, to measure that. So 10 to the six would be a reduction in a million cells per mil. Um, for example. So uh, just keep that in mind as we start to talk through these technologies because a higher log reduction will, will translate to a higher microbial stabilization effect or antimicrobial effect. I wanted to introduce a food processing concept which some folks in the wine industry may not be as familiar with it, but this is a hurdle technology. And it's a set of various methods used to inactivate microorganisms from food processing packaging all the way to the product shelf life. And for microbial stability, fermentation alone would be a great example of one hurdle um, in winemaking, while a second hurdle could be sterile filtration. And a third example could be uh, SO2 or Velcrin. Um, but today we'll be really focusing on the microbial control aspects, but you can see that there's many types of factors that um, go into hurdle technologies, temperature, pH, redox potential, water activity, various preservatives, uh, competitive microorganisms. And we're really in the future gonna hopefully focus on some of these other aspects and uh, just in general shelf life improvement for non-alcoholic beverages. With that, we're going to jump into microbial stabilization techniques and considerations, starting with additive techniques, chemical and clean label preservatives. Now here I'll be reviewing on a table the main chemical antimicrobial preservatives that are used in non-alcoholic wine and cider. Um, now these preservatives are very important tools for mitigating spoilage in non-alcoholic beverages. 
These are all generally recognized as safe and have been really well accepted worldwide, meaning that they have a low risk in relation to acute and chronic toxicity and have limitations of use for the protection of human health. Now, if we start with sulfur dioxide, it's typically in the form of potassium metabisulfide. This has been used since the Roman Empire and, and has um, been used as a wine additive since the early 1900s. It's currently an invaluable tool as it acts as an antioxidant and antimicrobial, with some of the advantages being that it's widely available, it has increased efficiency at low pH, um, it's antimicrobial and antioxidant, and it's relatively inexpensive. Now, some of the disadvantages are is that it does require an allergen labeling contains sulfites. And we're beginning to see more and more microbial resistance to SO2 as well. Um, high levels of SO2 can also contribute to camlider degradation and formation of volatile sulfur compounds. And it's less effective at higher pH, which can be a challenge too, as some people will use potassium uh, bicarbonate in formulation to reduce or to reduce acidity, which would then increase pH. So definitely is a consideration um, with um, formulation and making sure you have proper molecular SO2 protection, which is typically about 0.6 for red wines and 0.8 for white wines. Now, um, moving on to Velcrin or dimethyl dicarbonate, DMDC. Um, this has been approved since the um, late 80s by the FDA and is classified as a processing aid, not a chemical additive. Its efficacy is related to pH and microbial load, load which should really be below 500 colony forming units. So it really needs to be combined with some sort of a sterile filtration. And it imparts no off flavor and dissociates quickly into trace amounts of CO2 and methanol. Um, some of the advantages include that, of course, it's an effective antimicrobial. Um, and it's also one of the main uh, benefits is that you, there's no label requirement since the FDA considers this a processing aid. Um, disadvantages are that you need very specialized equipment and personal, personal personnel. It's a very expensive. Um, you need to apply some sort of uh, cell uh, reduction or cell fining or filtration uh, to make sure that you're below 500 cells. It's um, unfortunately not as effective against lactic acid and acetic acid bacteria. And it should really be combined with um, another antimicrobial tool or really antioxidant tool like SO2. And um, DMDC is very highly toxic um, within the time frame that it's active. So um, there's various quarantine measures that need to be taken place and there's definitely a negative um, outlook on Velcrin from various health and wellness um, stores and, and some consumers. The remaining two chemical preservatives that we have for non-alcoholic wine and cider are sodium benzoate and potassium sorbate. Now, sodium benzoate is a salt of benzoic acid, and it's widely used in the food and beverage industry. It's mainly inhibitory to yeast and molds. It's inexpensive, and it's also effective at uh, low pH or acidic beverages. Now, unfortunately, there is uh, some microbial resistance with non-saccharomyces yeast and to a degree bacteria, as you need much higher dosages to inhibit the growth of bacteria. It's also not very soluble at lower pH um, and should not be combined with specifically uh, ascorbic acid as it can form benzene, which is a known carcinogen, although uh, this is rare and at uh, low doses when it does form, and then the labeling requirement. And potassium sorbate is commonly used in the wine industry and food and beverage industry, um, in the wine industry more so for sweet wines but uh, it's widely available. It's also inhibitory to yeast and molds mainly. It's inexpensive, similar to sodium benzoate, and has some of the uh, challenges as well with microbial resistance. Um, it has poor solubility in water, and it's really not effective against um, acetic acid and lactic acid bacteria. And with lactic acid bacteria, you have a risk for um, a wine fault, which is called geranium taint. So that's an important thing to still cover if you're using a, a sorbate a preservative. And um, there's also some challenges with color shift and oxidation, um, but it's really recommended, all of these tools are really recommended to be combined with other 
preservatives or other types of hurdles. Now, um, I know that uh, these were the four common chemical preservatives for wine and cider. Um, now for beer, preservatives are a bit more limited as they fall under the TTP formulation approval process. And brewers uh, will mainly use thermal technologies as well as Velcrin when the pH is sufficient. Um, and they have the added benefit of hops and various botanicals that they can use to help with microbial uh, controls. So um, again, um, listed in the table are, is also some regulatory references, uh, but it's really, really important that um, you check with your compliance and regulatory um, entity as there is various uh, chemical preservatives that have uh, safety limits and it's really important to make sure that you are applying these appropriately and considering um, ingredients that are approved when exporting. Let's transition to talk about clean label preservatives and additives. More than ever, consumers are really demanding alternatives to various chemical preservatives and processing techniques. They, they want their food to stay fresh um, exponentially to a degree and retain all the products, original, sensory, all the while not having any additives or confusing processing associated with that. So I think a lot of this is also coming in to light more with the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainability Development. Uh, we're really seeing this uh, cult cultural shift uh, of government consumers focusing more on sustainability within manufacturing in general. And this uh, is the beverage industry is not exempt from this. So um, it's, it's interesting to date, there is no clear definition of clean label, but we can go through these points which capture the majority of, uh, of its uh, classification, let's say. So clean label additives are, are preservatives of natural origin that uh, can inhibit various microorganisms and are naturally derived. So um, this, this is an extremely tall order for the beverage sector as unfortunately many consumers struggle to understand the science involved with beverage manufacturing and processing and, and uh, these types of additives, but um, uh, let alone the, the difference between natural and organic. But it's, it's really important that as beverage manufacturers and uh, processors that we be diligent in understanding the market demographics and demands without compromising quality, health, and safety. Now, transparency, education, these are huge tools for gaining the trust of the emerging the younger generation who, will, who is and is, will be our key uh, consumers for this category. So uh, clean label preservatives on the market are typically proprietary formulations um, and they're from biological origins, such as uh, I've heard of proflips being used, uh, neem, rosemary, thyme, other types of terpenes, essential oils, which um, you know all are originating from like spices or herbs, and uh, it's uh, interesting as these compounds can have an antimicrobial effect. But it's also really important to consider the beverage compatibility, solubility can be a huge challenge with these ingredients, um, the efficiency, and as well as the sensorial impact um, is something that should be evaluated. Um, with, of course, all of the information that you can get from the supplier of the clean label ingredient, um, especially third party data can be really valuable to evaluate. Um, so with that, I think it's really important that we begin to explore these tools more. But again, we should really be making sure that we're in line with uh, the regulatory body that we are uh, governed by or exporting to. And there are some uh, tools here listed as far as the FDA for uh, grass and additives. And then um, what's the main difference between natural and organic um, for those people who are more and more interested in clean label. We're now gonna move on to physical techniques. But before I get started with thermal pasteurization, I wanted to just explain the difference between sterilization and inactivation. For beverages, the goal is really to inactivate any sort of vegetative pathogenic or spoilage type organism, as well as destroying some enzymes which could degrade or cause color change. While sterilization is much more readily applied for medical devices and requires much higher dosage of these different types of treatment to inactivate spores and really ultimately 
in beverages, our goal is inactivation um, over sterilization. Now for thermal technologies, we're first gonna start with the classical used low temperature, long time pasteurization. So this is also referred to as spray or in batch tunnel pasteurization. For beverages, this typically occurs at about 60 degrees Celsius to about 80 degrees Celsius for a designated amount of time, depending on the stability that you are targeting for your QA and QC and considering your cold chain and all of those factors. So one thing I do wanna bring up with pasteurization in general is there is this unit, which is called the pasteurization unit, which is essentially the time that it takes for heat to transfer through a packaging and into the beverage matrix. Now, this is really important because you use this, um, this uh, kind of, let's say, transfer, and then also a reference temperature for uh, a thermal resistance of a foodborne pathogen. And this is all factored within 60 seconds. So this is incorporating again, time, temp, and a known coefficient, which is the thermal resistance in foodborne pathogens. So increasing this temperature and altering the treatment time can really create many opportunities for variations within pasteurization and thermal technologies. So uh, the PU is really de determined based on the type of food or beverage that is being treated and varying beverages will need different treatments. So some of the benefits with uh, LTLT is that it really ensures package stability as it's in package sterilization. And it's also very commonly used. Some of the challenges is that it has a very impactful um, effect on sensory. There's been numerous um, research articles which have come out and have illustrated this, and a common aroma marker is furfural, which is a product of these heat or mired reactions and is commonly referenced um, to kind of uh, represent the staling or cooked scorched flavor in um, treated beverages. So some of the um, other challenges are that it consumes quite a bit of water and a lot of energy, space, and time as well. And on top of this, you're really changing aspects of color and there's also quite a bit of nutrient degradation as well that takes place. Next from thermal technologies, we have high temperature short time and ultra high temperature. But first I wanted to talk about aseptic processing, which goes hand in hand with these types of techniques. So aseptic processing is where a product is actually sterilized separately from the packaging prior to being filled into either a sterilized container under extremely clean conditions, or it can go through what's also called a hot fill technique, which is commonly used in the high temperature short time uh, pasteurization or flash pasteurization. So with this, basically beverages brought to very high temperature for about 15 to 30 seconds, and then it is filled under very extremely clean conditions into either sterilized package or very clean packaging. Now, ultra high temperature, as it sounds, is at a slightly elevated temperature in comparison to HTST, and it's a much shorter duration and treatment. And this is also sometimes applied in hot filling, but you'll typically find more HTST readily available. Some of the benefits are, is that it's available, it increases shelf life, there is less sensory alterations than tunnel, and it's a shorter processing time, but the challenges are is that it's extremely expensive, there's a risk for overheating, and again, you're having some of these same uh, detriment to sensory. And energy consumption, sustainability practices, again, this unfortunately does require a lot of energy, and there is a risk of contamination at packaging. So it's really important to consider this fill step um, as a critical control in your quality and HACCP programs. In this discussion, I really wanted to focus more on emerging non-thermal technologies for microbial stabilization. So non-thermal technologies use lethal agents other than heat to reduce or eliminate microorganisms that might be harmful or cause spoilage. So they demonstrate the pasteurization effect, have a variable efficacy on enzymes, 
and can be combined with other types of hurdle technologies as well for sterilization. Um, in general, they're much milder treatments um, and can also result in a product that is re refrigerate or cold chain food um, with significantly less scorched or cooked flavor and it complies with clean labeling. So uh, one thing that I've listed as far as the main thermal techniques, which are sterile filtration, high hydrostatic pressure, pulsed electric fields, ultrasound and ultraviolet light um, is sterile filtration. So uh, I, I didn't have a separate slide on this just because it's widely available technology, um, but some important considerations are beverage filterability and filter fouling, which are um, very important, especially when applying a sterile filter as it should be combined with other hurdles. So folks in the wine industry will commonly refer to sterile filtration as 0.45, but in uh, microbiology, it's defined at 0.2 as bacteria can still pass through 0.45. So when working with co-packers, it's critical to make sure that uh, they are doing regular integrity testing to ensure um, filter integrity and sterility. And as well, we should be thinking about various types of ingredients um, in the formulation step as they can have an effect on filterability and can contribute to filter fouling or very long packaging days. So there's different tools for improving filterability and also inline dosing units have really um, uh, improved in their technology and also their cleanliness. So um, sterile filtration um, is a massive tool which is widely used, widely available. Um, it is well known to have a flavor impact and um, also can impact the beverage uh, composition expel itself like polysaccharides, colloids. Um, so uh, it's uh, an, a really important non-thermal strategy, which is commonly used and should be used. Um, now with that, let's transition to talk more about high hydrostatic pressure, homogenization and processing. Now here we have ultra high pressure and high dynamic homogenization. These are two non-physical techniques which have really great promising applications in the wine industry for the reduction of sulfites as as well in non-alcoholic beverage processing. And what we see here is on the left, this is high pressure homogenization is sometimes also interchangeably used high dynamic homogenization. And we have a specific design where a liquid is being pumped um, forcefully through a very small opening. And this is called basically the, the uh, homogenization valve. And from here, the small opening along with the force that is being generated from pumping causes various types of cavitation and some temperature increase, which will have an effect on, of course, microorganisms that are present and to a degree enzymes. High dynamic homogenization is done at these lower pressures, which you can see here. And here on the right hand side, we have ultra high pressure, which is significantly higher, 300 to 400 megapascals. And there's many different types of valve designs which can be used to increase efficiency, increase antimicrobial effect. But what we can see definitely with ultra high pressure is much more efficiency in microbial inactivation and enzyme inactivation, which is quite challenging for a lot of these different physical techniques and presents a concern from oxidation, color change, but we'll get into that more in some follow-up webinars. But again, I think this, these really have some benefit and have significant log reductions as well with some of the papers which are listed below, but uh, it's a continuous system and has a very, very short processing time. And there's been not much significant impact on the studies done in wine on sensory and as well with some of those bioactive compounds even with multiple passes and treatments. Now the challenge with this technology is that the high dynamic homogenization is typically um, done in batch and it has a limited efficiency on enzyme deactivation and you really might need to do multiple passes in general to inactivate bacteria and spores and these, these technologies aren't as readily available, but we're seeing more and more companies looking into these types of hurdle technologies. Next, we have high pressure processing, which first became available in the early 1990s, and it consists of treating packaged beverages and food with high hydrostatic pressure. 
which can be up to 800 megapascals with varying temperature ranges from room temperature to about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is referred to as in packaging um, high pressure processing, which is a discontinuous process, unfortunately, and it requires specific compatible packaging. Recently, there has been some innovation with high pressure processing and the company Hyperbaric has come up with a concept of in batch, which is a semi-continuous uh, process. And what it is, is it's very similar to the concept of flash pasteurization, but instead using high pressure processing, which doesn't have as much of a detriment to sensorial properties as well as nutritive properties. So this uh, technology is, is attractive as it would easily replace some of, of this flash pasteurization equipment. And of course, pressure, temperature, time, and pH are really important factors as far as dialing in the treatment time for high pressure processing. And it's been mainly used in the juice industries, but it's becoming more widely available and affordable. So recently with the InBatch, that, um, that unit, there's only one in France, but to my knowledge, there's plans to have more of this in-batch technology available in North America. And there's many beverage pr producers or manufacturers who do offer tolling services for high pressure processing, which are readily available in the United States. Now, Pulse Electric Fields or PEF is a technology which where it basically is applying high voltage um, in a very short time, like microseconds, um, to food placed between two different electrodes. And the main parameters are temperature, time, the electrical field strength, and energy input, which um, are metrics of its, uh, you know, uh, log reduction capacity. Um, now, microbial inactivation by pulse electric fields is based on the rupture of microbial cells um, really in um, the membrane structure on the outside of their cells, which I think as we've all caught on to with this presentation, uh, bacteria, gram positive and gram negative, have varying uh, different types of sheath or a double membrane sheath, which make it much more resistant to some of these technologies and preservatives for that matter. Um, but anyway, with pulsed electric field, the the benefits are really promising actually for the wine industry and I believe for the non-alcoholic space in that it's continuous, it's very fast. It's an effective antimicrobial. There's been log reduction up to uh, five in wine. It's actually low energy consumption and there's minimal alterations to wine chemistry um, and beer chemistry for that matter. It's been looked at as an application in beer and in non-alcoholic beer. Um, some of the challenges are is that these liquids should be degassed, so it's not as effective with bacteria as mentioned, and there is a high voltage safety uh, risk as well, and beers can develop some of this light struck character, so that's an important consideration, but very promising uh, non-thermal technology PEF. Next we have ultrasound and ultraviolet light radiation. Ultrasound is utilizing high intensity and low frequency ultrasound waves, which essentially create these small bubbles that act almost as free radicals and cause some of these cavitation reactions. Now, the benefits is that this can be in batch and can also be semi-continuous, but the versatility of ultrasound, I think, is what is so promising. You could use it for homogenization, you could use it for extraction, emulsification, for degassing. But the challenge is specifically if we were to use this one hurdle is that it's very time consuming to have that sort of treatment and dosage to have that antimicrobial effect. And these higher intensity treatments can modify the beverage chemistry quite a bit as well, modifying the color, sensory, antioxidants, and polysaccharides. And, it's, and it is less effective against specific types of yeast and bacteria. Ultraviolet light radiation, as it's sound, is using UV light in the range of 20 to 400 nanometers to cause microbial inactivation through DNA damage. And the dosage is really based off of joules and flow rate. Now, the benefits are is that there's real minimal loss to nutrients. The sensory is, is, is not as modified as, as much, and there is low ener energy consumption compared to other types of techniques. But the challenge really is 
is how far the UV light can penetrate through a beverage, which is going to, to depend on its absorbance, solids, um, the density, and, and it's really not as effect, effective against enzyme deactivation. And it is less effective, as you would imagine, in red colored beverages like a red wine. There has been a few studies which have also illustrated the this uh, UV light struck riboflavin flavor with uh, beer as well. So that's something to consider. But both of these technologies, I think, are excellent hurdle technologies and can be incorporated into the beverage manufacturing and processing uh, design to have those additional hurdles for antimicrobial control. With that, I wanted to share some of the discussions that I had with the international team focusing on non-alcoholic beverage preservation market trends and demands. Joining me for our first discussion is BevZero South Africa, Gustav Fusch, the Managing Director, and Dylan Dow, Production Manager. What we see currently, or, or the protocols that we have at the, in, in our, uh, our service side, service side of non, non low alcohol wines, um, together what we see in, in the market, which is, which is actively used, um, in cellars and at bottling sites. It's always a combination of, of a couple of a couple of things. Obviously, cellar hygiene is number one. That base just needs to be covered. Um, then it's a combination of, of sulfur, um, tannins, filtration, the valkyrin, uh, and fermo. Uh, and, and what we currently use um, at Bev Zero um, at, at our facility is is a combination of, of, of those. Um, the sulfur we use. Um, traditionally use that in a normal strength wine as an overall preservative oxidization and some microbial streams together with that alcohol. But without the alcohol, the SO2 doesn't play such a major role in microbial um, stabilization anymore. Yes, it helps against oxidization, oxidization and, and some um, microbial growth. But not, that's not a, a major, major player. Um, so we, we definitely rely, rely on filtration a lot, um, filtration on site, filtration um, prior, to the, prior to the product leaving to the bottler site. And, and that, that, that helps with getting the, the cell count of the microorganisms low. It, it depends from yeast to, to other um, bacteria, it's especially yeast because uh, sugar plays a big role. I think if you focus on yeast, you immediately cover uh, most of the other microbials as well. Um, so filtration is a, is a big thing. We cross the wines from our facility um, before it goes to the, the bottling site. And, and we like to keep the chain as close as, close as possible um, in the terms as short as possible, also as as close in distance as possible. So we'll, we'll filter the wines and then send it to a bottling site um day or two prior to filling and and that's filtered then with a two micron um, crossflow filter or 0.2 micron crossflow filter and then at the bottling site it might it might go even through another filtration a smaller filtration prior to bottling just to keep that cell count low so so that's a probably a physical a physical one of the attributes that we can use in terms of microbial stabilization and then with that as well, inline filling um, Valkyrin, that, that, that's a, obviously a popular tool. It's a very effective tool. Uh, and we, I, I, I feel it's a, almost a non-negotiable tool currently at the moment, um, filling, filling in the bottle, just because it, it has a good effect, um, stabilizing the product, um, keeping it from helping from re-fermentation. Obviously, throughout the process, on-site and the bottling site, um, cleanliness and good IP practices are, are very important. We're seeing more and more of these um, emerging, well, physical techniques, which have been around for a long time, like uh, ultra-high pressure, ultrasound, UV. Um, uh, Dylan, I'd be curious to hear from at least your interaction with clients, um, uh, if you're aware of any of those types of technologies being available in South Africa, and just in general, what the demand is from clients um, in the U.S. here, there is definitely more of a movement for, um, let's say, low input and clean label ingredients, plant-based ingredients. Um, I'd be curious to kind of hear your perspective in that regards with the clients that you're working with. 
Yeah, just just those methods you mentioned now, to be deadly honest, I haven't heard the client speak about any any of those methods yet. Um, coming back to your uh, the label ingredients. Yeah, we we are working with suppliers that the the suppliers go through ratings and we when when I receive certificates from the suppliers, I take a look at this and are these suppliers actually adhering to the standards um, of BRC or ISO 22000. And the products that, that we are working with on, on our non-alcoholics or alcohol-free wines are, are vegetal based. So we are using vegetal um, based manoproteins, which is also has, has a combination with yeast. Um, uh, we use a tannin as well that I can say is from uh, a rooibos. I don't know if you know rooibos. It's a yeah, yeah. I've, it's a. I've I've uh, I've used it before in some trials. Um, but yeah, it's actually a great antioxidant tool. I know that in uh, South Africa, you guys also have the honey bush as well, which is sometimes used as an enological tannin. But um, yeah. I think uh, we're going to be doing some more internal trials on shelf life extension of non-alcoholic wines. But I think it's fantastic that you guys are using that as a tool. And there is also some side anti-microbial uh, activity with tannins as well, which a lot of people are just now really beginning to investigate more and more, so. Yeah, to add to, add to Dylan's point is a lot of our, our clients and all of the market really uh, have, has a need and appreciation for natural, natural products and um, non-synthetic or, or not over excessive chemical products. So we've designed all of our formulation or most of our formulations around natural natural ingredients that, that is currently allowed in winemaking practices in any case. So, so we, we have definitely a focus there on, on not as food beverage focus where you tend to use a, a, a lot of uh, stabilizers, enhancement flavors. We, we, we try to focus more on the traditional natural route in terms of, of natural allowed ingredients in, in winemaking. Um, but, but just to add on to my previous point, it, it's never one thing that that is that is in your microbial stabilization protocol. It's always a combination of um, uh, uh, many, many aspects. From BevZero Spain, we have the general manager, Silvia Sedeño and Grego Blanco, Quality and Research and Development Manager. There are two two parts in the when we manage uh, and when we work with this kind of products. One is the part before the bottling, and one is the part in, of the bottling. So before the bottling, we can uh, we have we can do certain practice, and for the bottling, we are gonna do something different. We could work. I mean, we are uh, standard in working with sulfur. Uh, sulfur can be for organic too, but for example, mm -hmm. for organic, when we bottle an organic wine, the only method that we could use is a pasteurization because, uh, for example, the MDC um, of Elcorin okay, is, yeah. uh, is not allowed to use for organic. So, I mean, uh, we, we always explain that there are that two parts of treating the product, you know, before the bottling and after the bottling. For example, uh, Belcorin it doesn't have any sense to use Belcorin, Belcorin, sorry, before the bottling because the Belcorin is acting, you know, in the moment. So in the moment, it's killing certain percentage of population of uh, microbia, but in the moment that is in contact with new ones, with new population, it's gonna get contaminated. So this is for nothing. So Belcorin, it has to be used in the bottling line. In relation to, you mentioned pasteurization, I'm curious how readily available that is in Spain. And then also if you guys are aware of any other types of physical techniques, whether it be ultra high pressure, um, UV, ultrasound, um, just be curious to hear um, of the uh, availability of that in Spain for your clients, especially with packaging. Uh, maybe Grego, I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. Um, with many um, suppliers of those types of technologies. Well, I think most of the clients are asking for uh, sulfur and DMDC or microfiltration or something like that, but not other new technologies for the moment. We know that there are a lot of uh, techniques to stabilizing the 
to make the stabilization of the product, like uh, you be lumps or yeah. high pressure or something like that. But for the moment, what I, what I know is uh, these techniques are in pilot uh, plants, not, a, not in, an, in an industrial way. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, Gregor is completely right. Um, so actually, what the wineries they are using and the bottlers they are using, lean, they are using, it is a um, stereo filtration. So it is a filtration uh, of, um, I mean, like uh, a microbic, we call it a microbic filtration that is 0 0.45. And after that, uh, belcorin is added. But in the cases of the organic, like we said before, they can just use uh, the filtration and then the pasteurization or pasteurization and after the filtration. That's the two different ways of working with this kind of products. But still, there is a lot to <clears throat> there is a, a lot to de uh, develop. In the category is growing and the category it's starting to be important, but uh, we are still in a step where the companies, they are not investing a lot in development. So we are, um, we are, our company is uh, one of the, the, the one or two, three companies in, in, in Spain that is investing in this kind of techniques, because even if it's not exactly the service that we are offering we are helping our clients to uh, to develop uh, to develop good techniques to uh, to make a good quality product from the us team we have kayla winter director of product services and chris anderson head of brewing operations what are some of the processing considerations with um, dealkalizing a beer and what different tools are you using to really ensure, I mean, overall stability, um, but specifically microbial stability from processing? And then maybe you can also touch on, you know, co-packers, what tools you're using as well when it comes to filling and packaging. Yeah, I mean, uh, almost all of the beers that we do, um, we're using oak tannins uh, for stability. Um, obviously, there is some microbial uh, going on there in terms of microbial thwart that it provides. Um, but mostly it's, it's kind of uh, an anti-oxygen component that it brings to the table. Um, some of our co-packers are using uh, pasteurization, either uh, tunnel or flash uh, for products that, uh, where the efficacy is there in terms of pH content. Uh, Velcrin is being employed um, and seeing really good results. Um, obviously, can't have anything with uh, a really high turbidity. Um, that, that can combat that that efficacy as well um, but under 4 ph is usually the the sweet spot for uh, any velcrin usage but those are the uh, primary techniques we see um, certainly with flash pasteurization that would need to coincide with the clean room and uh, closed filling techniques um, which not all uh, small brewers have um, but certainly some of the larger co-packers we work with have that capability yeah, it's interesting. I think with beer, it can handle a lot more pasteurization, um, just given its um, its chemical matrix and makeup. Um, there is a lot more risk, though, I feel like, with beer, considering that it's a higher pH. There's a lot more um, nitrogen compounds, um, substrates for microbial spoilage. In your experience with non-alcoholic products, what do you see being the predominant challenge as far as uh, microbial contamination and stability? Um, certainly, certainly lacto is, is, the, is the big problem. Um, and then, you know, when we, when we use these certain uh, thermal techniques, you know, uh, there's usually a cause and effect in terms of flavor degradation as a result of it. So, um, you know, with, with most respects, uh, you know, hoppy beers can be seriously affected. Um, obviously, the more pedestrian type of beer that we're talking about, um, there's less cause and effect. But um, certainly getting into like the IP any IPAs and stuff, it makes it a lot more difficult to yield uh, a really high quality product at the end. Yeah, unfortunately, you're using ingredients which also do have some antimicrobial activity like hops. And I think as we're starting to see more and more different types of formulations with other botanicals, there's some room, I think, more for beer in experimentation and using some of these natural antimicrobials, which 
in wine and in other uh, mediums can really impart uh, quite a organoleptic shift. But stylistically, I think there's a lot more flexibility with, with beer at least. But um, I'm excited to work in the future and really try to tease that out and vet some of these other natural antimicrobials, which are out there, or plant-based botanicals. Um, but hops themselves uh, kind of provide that, which is great. Um, and as a director of winemaking product services, I know that you work, you and your team work a lot with um, various types of ingredients and formulations. What are some of the key considerations just from the formulation aspect are you considering um, down, the, down the road with the effects of microbial stability? Uh, what type of, uh, let's say, concerns do you have with specific types of ingredients? Um, and what considerations and recommendations are you giving to your clients? Yeah, um, we do a ton of product development um, and we're always riding this balance between taste profile, stability, and then nutritional labeling. Um, because it's an FDA product, you have to declare everything that's added. So sometimes the best techniques uh, might not be either what tastes the best or it's something that a client doesn't want on their label. And so we really have to take all three of these into consideration and make sure the product still tastes amazing, but what we're doing does uh, provide the best uh, stability for the product moving forward during packaging, as well as once it's in bottle or can. Fortunately, I think given that we are working with a low pH beverage with wine, with beer, it's another story. <laughs> it's a little bit more complicated, um, but we have many different types of tools and techniques that I think we can learn from more classical beverage uh, co-packers and adopt that as well within the wine industry and wine space. Combining different types of technologies is super important, you know, physical and additive in order for us to make sure that we're really covering our bases considering we're working with something that is a substrate for microbial spoilage, especially if there's going to be high levels of, um, you know, any sort of sugar or various carbohydrate ingredients or vitamin ingredients that are that are a part of that formulation. But um, I guess I, I'll, just to kind of wrap things up, Chris, I'm really curious to hear from more of the brewing side what um, what your clients are really looking for as far as preservative tools, or do you feel like there's more, let's say, tenure? within the brewing industry, just given that I know tunnel pasteurization has been used quite often and for many years, or do you see much innovation as far as people looking into new pres preservation techniques for NA beers specifically? Yeah, certainly uh, this last week I was at the CCBA and, and there was several different uh, you know, products brought to the table that, that uh, people are using. Honestly, most most everyone that, that we work with is using uh, some form of pasteurization. Um, there's only a, a handful of beers that are are even able to use Velcrin or are are formulated to achieve that. Um, on the other side, which is is to add fruit or other additions to bring that 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 pH down. Um, so those are those seem to be the real real uh, common and and obviously the the label implications with Velcrin um, are, are are very um, positive because it, you know, theoretically it has, has no effect on that. Um, and, and typically no flavor, um, impact as well. So, um, yeah, those, those seem to be, uh, the, the majority of what, what, uh, folks are using in the industry right now. And some people are not using anything at all. And, uh, you know, in my opinion, that's a little bit of a ticking time bomb. Um, especially when you're talking about, um, a beer that's, that's gone through the arrested process and hasn't even gone through any type of, uh, distillation, which is, you know, somewhat of a kill step. Um, so that's the other piece. Thanks, Chris. And, um, Kayla, I, I kind of want to throw the same question at you as well. What are you really seeing as far as demands from your clients, whether it be clean label ingredients, um, other types of processing techniques? I'm very curious to just hear what, what you're really, um, exploring with your clients as well. Yeah, um, most of our clients are using a uh, combination of Velcrin and filtration and SO2 uh, as preservatives, but there are a fair amount of health and wellness retailers that are demanding that we uh, don't use Velcrin. And so um, having a solution for that is really where we're seeing um, a lot of the requests from clients coming in and just trying to figure out is what's the solution. It's likely not going to be one thing. It's going to be a combination of uh, different preservative tools and methods, but um, that's something that we're definitely working on to make sure that we can cater to these brands that are showing a ton of success and 
being picked up by these large health and wellness retailers. Um, so we want them to succeed. In so in summary, I wanted to highlight some of the key techniques that our international team are currently using, and then also look at some of these different emerging physical technologies and multi-targeted preservation techniques, which have promise specifically for the non-alcoholic beverage category. So from the additive techniques, SO2 and Velcrin seem to be indispensable at the moment, as well as a combination of antioxidant and antimicrobial tannins. Of course, people are really wanting a clean label solution and there, there is some available, but we need to be doing more and more shelf life studies to really explore these, as well as understanding the acceptability with some of the organoleptic impact. Physical techniques, which have, I think, the most promise for the non-alcoholic category, which are non-thermal, would be high pressure processing, pulse electric field, ultra high pressure processing, and UV. I did not list sterile filtration because that goes without saying that sterile filtration is being used as a hurdle in combination with some of these additive techniques currently with our clients. Now, multi-targeted preservation and hurdle technology combination, I think is really what we need to start exploring, especially if we want to retain sensory and also some of this nutrient uh, aspect of these different types of beverage. Ultra high pressure processing and pulse electric field have a great application as they could both be in a continuous system. Ultrasound and pulse electric field as well, especially with the versatility of ultrasound and its other factors that it could be used in for homogenization or degassing. And then all of these technologies can be combined with some thermal techniques too to mitigate some of the heat treatment time of these thermal uh, techniques and really create a beverage which is going to be more nutritive and have better overall quality while having an extended shelf life. Here we have all of the resources and citations that were presented throughout this presentation. And with that, it's time for our Q&A. Thanks everybody for your attention.